All right, hello, it's Mr. Cherrick again. Uh, this ask assignment for painting is solely concerned with how you handle and apply the paint to the canvas. So, as you can see in this first slide, there's two different ways of going about this. Uh, there's kind of a looser style uh, that's a lot more impressionistic. Um, impressionistic just means you give a faint impression of your subject as opposed to this really tight, controlled, super representational uh, way of, you know, painting. Uh, another word you might hear used is, is expressionistic. And expressionist marks are usually marks that are so visible that you can tell what made the mark. So these, these paint marks up here might be considered expressionistic as well. Um, you're going to hear me call them impressionistic, though, throughout this entire assignment. Uh, the other option or for painting would be a hard edge uh, style. And a hard edge style just means that the edges are super crisp and hard. Uh, both of these styles have long lineages, and I'll get into that, but uh, these are your two main options for this core uh, assignment here. So your first option is an impressionist painting. Uh, for an impressionist painting, you have to use short, choppy strokes that are really, really uh, loose and don't really con conform to what it is you're trying to represent. Uh, you can use any support. You can use any kind of color. You don't have to match the color of your subject exactly. You can kind of subjectively mix your colors close to what your subject is. Um, and you can use any kind of reference, uh, but you have to have some kind of reference. Uh, notice I make note here that it needs to be a photographic reference of a real person, place, or thing shot in a natural sunlight sort of lighting. Uh, the reason for this I'll go into later about uh, kind of the history of Impressionist painters, but um, that's kind of a small requirement that, that sort of opens up a lot of options for you. Um, impressionist painting is sort of typified by certain kinds of equipment and a very specific style. So typically artists when they paint impressionistically they'll use this kind of long handled uh, stiff bristle brush. Um, stiff bristles make those kind of really pronounced strokes and then the long handle is so that you can hold further back on the handle kind of like this picture here and sort of like lose control when you make your mark. Now. Here's a photographic reference of a, a peach and a strawberry, and you notice the way the artist painted it. It's, it's kind of loose, like the strawberry isn't quite where it needs to be. The colors are a little bit different. Uh, notice there's no black. Um, that's kind of typical of the Impressionist style, so that's kind of what you're expected to do if you pick this style. Uh, you, you can mix your colors however you want, and you can use any kind of stroke you want, but you cannot use black. And you should use a natural light source. Um, notice here I, I kind of make mention of the black thing quite a few times. Please don't use black. Uh, try to mix your dark shadow areas with just pure color and you'll notice kind of that does a lot to your it does a lot to your painting. Remember your complementary color value scales from your painting theory poster? That's kind of what I want you to do to make dark uh, neutral tones. So mix complementary colors. So, Impressionism has a long and storied history, and to be quite honest, before I'm giving this presentation here, I haven't actually brushed up on much of it, so I'm going to skip over a lot of these paintings here, but uh, I am going to stop at a couple of them to sort of explain certain things about them that are kind of important to this assignment and sort of illustrate some key points I want to make. So, if you want to stay with me through this section, you can. Otherwise, you can kind of skip ahead to the demonstration, or you can skip to the next assignment. But if you're picking this project, I would stick with me right now and sort of get some of the history behind why it is Impressionist painters painted the way they painted, and, and kind of what you can do with this project. So, first off, notice uh, the time zone here. It's late 1800s here, 19th century, late 19th century. Um, and the, the father of Impressionism could be considered uh, uh, Claude Monet. Uh, this is a, a wide-angle shot of his Agapanthus uh, triptych. This triptych is massive. 
uh, it's a it's a painting of his lily pond on his in the back of his house, and it's just just absolutely massive painting. You can see from the woman standing there that it's about her height and you know several body lengths wide. Um, if you look real close at this painting, uh, you'll notice that from afar, you know, in the upper right left hand corner here, you can see the painting. It looks kind of like lily pads on a lake, but when you really really look up close. Uh, just look at these brush strokes. I mean, they're just an absolute mess. Uh, he's just gooping on color and, and thick, thick, broad strokes. So, um, you know, he, he's skipping the, across the canvas. Um, his his lily pad paintings are really, really loose. So, you know, when you paint impressionistically, you can be just as loose as he is. Uh, but notice, I mean, even though he's being loose, he's, he's certainly got, um, you know, an awful lot of detail. There's there's enough detail here to notice that it is an actual lily pad he's painting. Uh, there's a self-portrait of Claude Monet. Notice it's unfinished, but you can kind of see some of the gestural direction of the strokes here. Um, one of his most famous paintings uh, was this, uh, Impression Sunrise. I don't mean remember much about this painting. I, I believe it was uh, submitted to the Salon and rejected, so he kind of showed it at the Salon des Refusés, which is just the rejected Salon paintings. He kind of started his own show just because he got kicked out. And this, this painting kind of exemplifies, again, his brushstroke style. You can literally see the, the short, choppy strokes. You can see the gesture he made with those strokes. Just a quick stroke, stroke, stroke. Just really, really brief. Um, even the sky here, you can tell he kind of went back and forth with his brush and just sort of mixed the orange with the blue. Um, you're allowed to be this free with this painting if you want. Um, so look to this for inspiration. Claude Monet. Monet was uh, really, really concerned with how, and well, most of the Impressionists were concerned with how light reacted with objects. So here's his, um, you know, uh, Ruin Cathedral uh, series, and uh, you notice he painted it quite a few times. And each time he actually painted it, uh, he painted it at a different time of the day. So the light would hit the cathedral and sort of change the colors of the cathedral. Like sometimes he'd paint it like pink, or you know, completely washed out in the sunlight, or you know, it'd be kind of dawn or you know, late at night, and it have a completely different cast or hue to it. And he didn't really paint it, you know. Uh, tightly, you know, it's super choppy and, and loose, kind of like his other style. It's very thick, actually. So, you know, if you ever look at one of these paintings, just notice the colors he used and the way the paint is applied. It's it's super loose and again, barely any black. Lots of browns and purples. Like if you look at the shadows here, that's like blue and purple and red and brown. It's it's not so much pure black. This is another series. This one you probably more than likely have seen because it's in uh, a, a handful of these paintings are in Milwaukee. I know I've seen this particular painting or one of these paintings in this series. They kind of all blend together. Um, his paintings of haystacks are just wonderful examples of how, you know, not to use black and just to make your shadows with just a variety of different colors like purples and blues. So kind of look to these paintings as good examples of uh, what to do when you're making darker colors. So, a couple notes on uh, Miss, Miss Cassatt here. Uh, she's an Impressionist painter, but unlike Monet and some of the other Impressionist and post-impressionist painters. Uh, she's actually pretty tight um, Even though she is tight. She was incredibly loose uh, For the time uh, if you've ever seen any of the contemporary painters of her time I mean she's she's incredibly loose uh, and you really do have to see the painting up close to really get the sense but uh here, even though the you know the child and the mother is painted tight you can even notice in the background here These are some pretty loose strokes uh, you, you can be tight and mix in looser strokes. It doesn't necessarily mean your whole painting should be tight or that you should try to be tight. Even when she is being tight, like in the folds here of the fabric, 
there's quite a lot of overlap and just sort of rough scraggly edges um, just sort of play around with both sides of the coin if you can't handle being you know uh, super loose then you might want to try some something like Miss Cassatt just sort of a mix between loose and tight Um, just a couple of quick words on John Singer Sargent. He is by far one of my favorite painters of all time. He's up there with some of my other favorites. And the only reason why is, even though he kind of painted like, you know, high society and just sort of like kind of nonsense, uh, you know, not very deep, not very, you know, dark kinds of paintings. Even though he painted kind of fluffy paintings, uh, just the way he handled paint was just so masterful. Um, if you're an actual painter, like a true painter, um, you'll appreciate him. And I've included this particular example because it just exemplifies what I'm talking about. If you look at the portrait at the right, you notice she is just beautifully rendered, 100% um, uh, exact likeness. And, and Sargent was actually very famous for, you know, painting a portrait of a person and then just being dissatisfied with it and scraping the entire face off and painting it again. But uh, when it came to the rest of it, he would just, just... I don't know, just blow it out of the water, like, really, really quickly. If you look at the sash on the left here, you know, it does look like a silk sash, but you can really tell his brush strokes, just a quick strokes here, stroke there, you know, little flicks of the the, the brush. But it, it just it still resembles what it's supposed to resemble. Uh, this is... This is the height of Impressionism. This is the height of what you hope to achieve when you paint this way. Uh, it has a real sense of sprezzatura, which is Italian for kind of like a learned casualness. Um, uh, if you ever really want to know how to paint well, impressionistically or loosely, look to Sargent's examples and the way he handles paint. Vasquez is also a very good example, uh, but Vasquez was far earlier than most of these guys, and, and, and in a way, he was much tighter, but again, same same qualities of paint, just casual, spreads it to a little flicks here and there, that sort of it perfectly captured his subject, but were incredibly loose. So, post-impressionism happened after impressionism, uh, chronologically, and then stylistically, they kind of hold some of the same tenets, but post-impressionists were concerned primarily with how color could be represented on the canvas. They sort of got away from kind of that loose sort of like, this is an impression of this, and you know, they kind of made a cohesive style out of it, and, and were sort of more concerned with optical illusion and the optical qualities of color on the canvas. Uh, the noted, uh, you know, practitioner of this was uh, Surratt, and uh, you've probably all seen um, Sunday on, on the Grand Jatte, uh I forgot what it is in French. But this painting literally took two years, and he basically just used tiny dots of color. Post-Impressionism is typified by these tiny dots of color. So if you want to use this style, I mean, it's kind of tedious, but, you know, it's it's one way to go about it. To make greens, you know, you'd use yellow and, and blues and green dots next to each other, and then from afar, those kind of optically mix. It kind of predated pixelation and how, you know, computer screens work in a way. If you want, um, just take a look at some of the post-impressionist slides and just sort of soak in kind of their particular style and how they paint. That's a lot more controlled than the previous examples, but there's no reason you can't loosen it up or make your marks bigger.
Here we have um, some excellent student examples from last year. Uh, a lot of students that picked uh, Impressionism kind of struggled with the concept at first, but a lot of them had uh, great success with it. So uh, keep in mind when you paint it, there's a there's a billion different solutions for it. Uh, notice this one up here on the left, like really big broad strokes, whereas you know down here it's a combination of tight and loose. It doesn't really matter what uh, style you use or what subject you use so long as it's naturally lit and then it doesn't need to stick to the form exactly just sort of have fun playing around with the paint and and just sort of you know like pushing it around the canvas um, these student examples here uh, these are student exam students that are are not mine but sort of chose the same project and the they use the post impressionist style so lots of the, lots of stippling which is the name of those kind of like dot marks um, and then they they pre-mixed their mixtures and put them on the canvas so like they mixed flesh tones and dotted them on the canvas and they optically mixed their colors so they mixed uh, you know like here on the right they mix like uh, different kinds of flesh tones together to get you know sort of like a gradual blend effect from it uh, just take a look at a couple of these examples this is again another option open to if you choose this project and it's a really really easy option um, if you sort of stick with it uh, you can get some great results um, you're your second choice for the paint handling assignment is a uh, hard edge painting and hard edge painting has a whole separate set of concerns uh, for this particular assignment I expect you to uh, paint with extremely crisp and straight edges you can do this by hand or you can use masking tape uh, to help mask your edges uh, masking tape works really really well sometimes though uh, the paint will leak under it and sometimes the paint will tear paper uh, and those are kind of things you have to watch out for but I'll show you that in the demo um, before you start you must kind of choose to make it uh, symmetrical or a really well balanced asymmetrical design um, and that kind of means that you have to sketch it out in advance and sort of like make a choice before you start painting as to what your composition is going to be uh, unlike the impressionist painters who have a subject to go on hard edge painting uh, it kind of frees you from having to paint a particular subject you could potentially paint a subject or evoke a subject but i recommend you sort of make it just abstract shapes and colors because 90 percent of your concern is going to be with your technique which is really really hard in this project for some students um, so the other requirement though uh, that I require of you is uh, you, you need at least 10 steps of value or 10 variations in saturation intensity for at least uh, for different colors. Um, with the Impressionist project it's, it's kind of guaranteed that students are going to use a lot of different colors to represent their subject and I don't have any problems um, seeing a bunch of different combinations or, or palette mixes with them. Uh, but for students doing the hard edge painting I kind of have to force you guys to make lots of different colors otherwise you'll just you know kind of look at the minimalist artists in this in the examples that'll follow and you'll just sort of be like well why, why can't I just paint blue and yellow and and I don't want you to be that simple I want you to try to balance a, a bunch of concerns at once I want to challenge you so here is how you would make a uh, symmetrical uh, concentric design um, the easy thing about this is is that your composition is automatically a well-balanced well-made composition uh, this artist here started with a simple square and then he copied that square twice three times four times okay and what he ended up with was kind of cool looking uh, you know you don't have to make it look like that in any way shape or form you can use curved lines if you want you can do it kind of however you want um, and then he painted his using again four or so colors and you know with ten different value steps okay 
if you don't want to do a symmetrical or, or concentric design or what have you, then you must make a sketch or really plan out in advance what your um, your asymmetrical composition is going to be. These are examples of, of students or professional artists who make like thumbnail designs for abstract paintings. So uh, tons of tons of examples here. And then you know, obviously, when, if you choose to do this, make sure you make some sketches first. Um, when you use masking tape, um, there's a there's a bunch of different options. Uh, what's pictured here is using an acrylic acrylic uh, gel medium. Um, I'm going to actually look into investing in some of this, but we do have some tape, and the tape is what makes the crisp edges. So if you need a shape or you've drawn a shape out on your canvas, just take the tape and push it down along the shape edges and then paint over the tape and it'll keep the edges nice and crisp. Um, I'll also show you how to do this on the demo, but here's just kind of a quick preview of that. Here's some student examples. These are excellent student examples. Concentric designs, the right amount of colors, the right amount of value shifts. More examples. Again, great great job on these. And then here's some student examples from last year. Um, I kind of took them with my camera so some of them are sort of blurry but again great examples. You can see on the far right here that there's actually some asymmetrical designs and these are really well done. Um, however you go about design totally up to you. Uh, the lower left hand corner here that's that's watercolor and, and some of these even though they don't have as many value shifts as they probably should have are still great examples of this particular style and the students really learn how to make nice solid crisp edges. Now we're going to get into um, some art history here and some artists that sort of exemplify cri the criteria for the assignment. Again, I don't expect you to listen to this if you're really not interested in this particular assignment, but uh, this history will kind of explain, for those of you who do want to do this assignment, kind of the lineage or the tradition behind this style. And again, I'm only going to talk about uh, a couple of uh, artists and, and slides, so if you kind of see someone in the presentation that you want to know more about, make sure you look them up. First example here, uh, this guy's name, not quite sure how to pronounce, uh, Vassarelli. <laughs> Uh, but he's one of the op artists from the 60s and uh, really really trippy visuals here He kind of look kind of looks like your canvas is moving I can show you how to do this kind of warped look if you want me to but again uh, lots of different value ships real simple uh, concentric symmetrical design this guy's name I definitely don't know how to pronounce well I think it's pronounced Enoskevich. Um Again, exemplifies that kind of like optical illusion art from the 60s. Uh, very, very kind of mind-bending to look at. Uh, Miss Hobart, she's actually a contemporary artist, but again, same number of value shifts, real simple compositions, very minimal. And then Stukovicu. I believe is how this artist was pronounced and she also exemplifies our criteria for the assignment but she again is a contemporary artist not nearly as famous as the previous hand. Um, right here I included this example at the front half because uh, Mr. Burko actually exemplifies what I would expect from you if you were to do an asymmetrical composition. He has enough value shifts and he has balanced compositions. So if you do want to do an asymmetrical composition, kind of look to his paintings for an example. All right, so the rest of these examples um, are what uh, pretty much any artist who's uh, classically trained and has had a bit of art history would call paintings in the hard edge style. So I'm not going to take a lot of time to explain uh, most of these artists because most of them are contemporary artists, but a few here at the start here um, are what are classically known as like the fathers of hard edge abstractionism, extraction painting style. Uh, I don't know a, a, 
a bunch about all of these artists, but um, if you do ask me about them, I can point you towards sort of resources to learn more about them. And then some artists I do know quite a bit more about than others. So uh, yeah, just feel free to ask me or research any anybody that looks interesting to you. This first artist here you should probably all recognize by now, but uh, Piet Mondrian is sort of the father of just sort of this philosophy that you know only a handful of colors and shapes is all we need to convey you know uh, art or beauty um, he kind of started something in the Netherlands called distigil or I don't know how to pronounce it in Dutch but it phonetically looks like that in English uh, but that just is Dutch for the style and he sort of invented this because he wanted to start like this whole utopic uh, idea that if only we, you know, simplified everything down, we could convey beauty perfectly and, and unify it with everything we do. And so, you know, there's a lot of architecture and, and you know, in industrial or, you know, interior design based on his style and the whole Bauhaus movement. So if you look him up, there's quite a lot behind these paintings besides just, you know, the simple blue, yellow, and red that you see. The other artist that could be considered kind of the start of abstraction and primarily is considered the father of abstraction in many ways, in certain ways uh, at least, is uh, Wassily Kandinsky. Kandinsky was just revolutionary in so many ways, but primarily what he did was, and the thing that I think is kind of coolest about him is that he would kind of take music and he would kind of say to himself, well, music doesn't really have content. So, you know, why, why should painting have content? You know, like you could listen to a, a classical, uh, you know, symphony and, you know, there's no words really, but, you know, it evokes images in you and it evokes feeling in you. So he kind of took that philosophy when he made his art. And a lot of his paintings are based on musical concepts. Uh, these are kind of examples of his more controlled hard edge style. And it's really playful and fun and colorful, but if you just sort of think in that way, like, oh, well, music sometimes doesn't have content, but it evokes moods, uh, you'll kind of understand why abstraction sort of holds its place in uh, history. For the next couple of sections here, um, they're just kind of categorized by like just random categories that I kind of assign to the artist. Uh, I don't know. It's There's so many um, abstract artists that you, you couldn't possibly show all of them and you couldn't possibly categorize them any other way but like color and style or content. It's just impossible. So each of these sections sort of briefly introduces you to a handful of artists that sort of have a stylistic similarity. So like this first section here, artists who use bands or lines of color, you know, you'll see artists like uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Davis here, super famous for paintings that are just pure bands of color. Um, yeah, you got me. <laughs> uh, I get them. I mean, they're really pleasant to look at, but uh, this guy is literally famous for just makes like makes thousands of dollars for each of these these paintings and he paints them by hand and they're just just like the organization of color and they're they're all concerned with yeah so yeah i don't i don't quite understand the whole of all of it but it's not like you have to if you know what you like and you like it you can you can make a painting like this if you want uh just take a look at each section and just sort of skip around and, and just sort of, yeah, look up artists that you like their style or their work or look up artists that are similar to those artists if you want to find some uh, real inspiration for what to do for this project.
I should say really quickly, um, in in uh, abstraction and like con- you know the lineage of abstraction, there are quite a few forefathers. Condensing it being one of them, Albers is one of the other main guys. Albers is kind of famous for being an artist and a teacher, and kind of a philosophist about philosopher about this whole idea and this whole movement. One of his most famous series is the Homage to the Square which is pictured here. Um, These are all separate paintings, mind you, and they're all just basically squares layered on on top of each other. And he was very concerned with the theory of color and just how simple you could get. But he's one of the forefathers of abstraction and abstract thought. Um, So, you know, these next couple of slides here, uh, I believe these guys are all kind of important. Kelly, um, Mangold, all these guys. So look into these guys if you really want to understand sort of the genesis of some of these ideas. All right, one last quick note. Um, The artists contained in this section uh, do not exemplify the criteria for the assignment, but they're still considered part of the lineage of hard edge abstraction. Um, The reason I'm talking to you about them is because this style is still currently being developed, and so contemporary artists are still referring to it. They still use it as a common language, common visual language. And uh, if you look at some of these artists, you know, they're taking the foundation and they're really innovating upon it. Um, This next artist in particular is kind of crucial. This this artist, uh, Laura Owens, is she's, well, she's a she, which is kind of important because most of these hard edge abstraction uh, artists were guys at the start. And so abstraction was considered primarily a male language until artists like her came along and you know there there were artists before her but um, she's kind of at the leading forefront of sort of like what this style means and where it could go so a lot of her work evokes some very contemporary themes chief among them if you look at them or you know if you look at this painting on the uh, left right here you see how these strokes look kind of impressionistic or abstract or you know even expressionistic well she's kind of blending that style with the hard edge style. And if you look even closer, like there's shadows underneath these strokes. So even though they end at a hard edge, they look like they're floating. And actually, uh, most of the you know crit- critics who comment upon her work are like, well, it kind of looks like it's out of Photoshop. And then she's got this text in the background and it's all dissociative and postmodern and uh, deconstructionist, which I'm not even gonna begin to get in with, get into with you guys, but um. Really look into her and her contemporaries if you kind of want to understand where abstraction is right now and how how it's still vital and how it's still a living, breathing thing. You have two choices for the pain handling assignment. Uh, the first choice, I believe, is Impressionism, and then I think the second choice is the hard edge painting. Um, I'm going to walk you through the hard edge painting uh, first, uh, and I'm going to show you how to do a uh, sort of a symmetrical design for that. Uh, it's real simple. You just got to have a ruler, and you got to know the dimensions of your paper. So I'm using my sketchbook again. You'll have other options. You can kind of make it whatever size you want, so long as you make it uh, a little bit larger than this. This is, I believe, uh, yeah, 12 inches by about 12 inches here. So 
it'll be really easy to kind of divide. And I'm going to do a radial symmetry uh, design here, radially symmetrical design. So I'm going to find halfway, which is six of each side, and then I'm going to draw two lines of symmetry uh, through my paper here. Now, a line of symmetry is something where you repeat the same from the same distance across that that axis. Um, so you need these axes to kind of ground yourself. Uh, whatever you draw on one side, you will draw on the other. And you can use measurements to kind of help you draw stuff accurately. So I've got my, uh, my axes here of symmetry. And I can make a mark every inch, every two inches. Doesn't really matter. Um, I'm actually going to make mine every inch real quick here. And, uh, you know, again, if you want a more detailed, more complex design, do them every half inch. Uh, every one inch works just fine too. Uh, you'll see as I do this design here kind of what happens. Um, now I, now I got to pick kind of a system or a, a make a design. And I can even add more axes if I want. Like I could do a, a diagonal one if I want. I could do a, uh, you know, let's just do a diagonal one real quick for fun. Okay. Divide my paper up here. All right. I could do... I could do circles now. I could do any kind of design, any kind of geometric design I want. Um, I'm going to make kind of a star shape. So let's let's break this up into inches. Okay, going one inch out, and then I can connect these marks however I want. If I keep it consistent and I measure from the same point, same amount of marks, my design will stay rigidly consistent here. So if I start connecting marks. Uh, you know, one mark up to two marks up, that'll keep it consistent. Okay, let's do that. Let's do uh, one mark to two marks up in one quadrant here. Just see how that looks. Okay. And then let's keep connecting from that same mark there just to see what it looks like. Kind of a cool star shape starting right there. We can do it on the same way, same side. And I'm not being very precise. Obviously when you do yours, please try to mark, me measure your marks a little bit slower, a little bit more careful. Okay? So I did two, three lines here from the same point to these three, and then I did these two how, like that. So if I want to rotate that, think in terms of the same way, doing the same thing. So again, one mark here to one, two, three marks up. Okay, and then mark, mark, right like that. Okay. okay and I can keep rotating those around. Now you're probably wondering yourself, uh, I don't get it. Uh, what's the point here? Um, well, the point is to make a uh, symmetrical design. Symmetrical designs are always balanced. They're kind of why I rely on symmetrical designs uh, because then I don't have to do all the rigmarole of like, you know, balancing my composition, thinking about what goes where. It's just automatically whatever I put there. If I repeat it or or uh, mirror image it. It always turns out good. Okay, so now I can continue to add to my design if I want. I can I can connect these lines in different ways. I can connect it that way. It's it's totally up to me. I'm actually going to do that. Let's see how that looks. Okay, make kind of a continuation of our star here. Right. Okay, I can keep going around, keep connecting. So you kind of get the point here. No matter what I do, I need to repeat it in my other quadrants to kind of make a symmetrical design. And I'm kind of winding up here with this kind of weird rotated star design. Um, it's just sort of random. I'm not really thinking about it ahead of time. If you want to know what your design is going to look like before you do it, uh, take the time to really figure it out. Like, 
do some sketches. Uh, maybe do a couple of these where you just sort of randomly connect lines and, and then rotate it and keep connecting them the same way to see how it looks. doesn't matter how you do it, so long as you've got a design that you're happy with and so long as it's symmetrical. The other option, of course, is to make an asymmetrical design. That's fine as well. Just make sure you do a couple of sketches and figure out how it's going to look before you commit a lot of time to kind of sketching it out on your paper. Okay, the next thing for the paint handling uh, project here is to uh, paint really crisp edges. So to do that, uh, I'll kind of show you how to tape and, and mask. All right, so for the paint handling assignments, the hard edge painting, you need to paint with extremely crisp edges. I should not see any like frayed or sloppy edges. Uh, to help you with this, you can use painter's tape. Now, this is a different kind of painter's tape than we have at the school. It's blue, um, but you needn't worry. They're pretty much the same thing. Um, and when you do paint on paper, you got to be kind of careful with the painter's tape. Sometimes it is strong enough to peel the paper back up. So uh, don't press too hard with it. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask off one of these tiny little uh, triangle sections in here. Uh, tiny areas are really hard to paint crisply. Or, you know, big long edges like this are really hard to paint crisply. So I'm going to use painter's tape to kind of help with that. Actually, let's do, yeah, let's do a big area here. So bring the painter's tape right up to the edge, okay? When you got it kind of laid down, you can use your finger to smooth it. You can use your palette knife to kind of help push it down and keep it smooth. Make sure your palette knife is clean, okay? And just mask off all the edges. Now, if you want even crisper edges, I believe we have some uh, gel medium in the closet that you can use. Gel medium actually helps, I, I think, make the edges crisper, especially if you're painting on canvas board, because canvas board has a little bit of texture to it. Uh, so you can try that method if you want. We don't have a lot, all right? And I'm just going to try to get that down there as precise as possible, just outside my pencil lines. It's okay if I'm not super precise. When I paint the next shape over, I will have that crisp edge to rely on, okay? Now, I'm just going to paint one shape here with the masking tape. Obviously, if you know you need this same color in the same area, you could mask out both areas, make that mixture, paint in those areas, and be done with that mixture. Uh, the requirement for the assignment is that you have at least uh, four different colors in here, and then do at least 10 different value steps for all four colors for a total of like 40 different shifts. Now, you can do any kind of shift you want. You can do a shift from color to color, so like blue to red. I could do a shift from blue to white. I can do 10 steps from blue to black, or 10 steps from black to pure blue to white. Doesn't really matter how you do your 10 shifts for all four colors. Um, the reason for that, again, is to just ensure that you mix enough colors. With the uh, Impressionist painting, you'll be making tons of mixtures anyway, so this kind of guarantees that you do the same amount of work as they are. All right, so I'm going to paint this uh, kind of a purpley color here, so I can take a little bit of red and a little bit of blue here and kind of make a consistent mixture of purple, enough to paint two areas, and I'm actually going to demonstrate how to paint precise over here, some tricks for that, okay? So hopefully I have enough in this mixture. Okay. All right, so when you paint on painter's tape, you don't have to really acknowledge the edges all too much. Just make sure your brush strokes are nice and consistent and, and even when you apply the paint, okay? And you can bring it right up to that edge and over that edge, okay? I'm painting on paper so you can really see my brush strokes. But when you paint, try to keep it nice, consistent, You've got no excuse to make your brush stroke sloppy because you have a nice protected area to paint in, okay? So I can get that nice and flat, right? Uh, let's pretend this is dried and we're ready to peel the paint. You can wait until it dries or you can peel it while it's wet. Uh, I don't really care, okay? And you got nice clean edges right there, perfectly crisp edges, okay? Uh, be careful that you don't damage your paper when you peel up the tape. Peel into the tape, so like right down at a high angle, don't peel up, okay? 
If you peel against the tape, you will create crisper edges. Okay? And the painter's tape is not always going to be perfect. You can see there's some uh, bleed over right there. I probably didn't press it down hard enough, or maybe I had a little bit too much water in my tape and it just sort of seeped under. That's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just want to get nice, crisp, clean edges there. Okay? And not bad. All right, when I paint my next color, I can probably clean up some of those edges if I want. Uh, you just want to get as crisp as you can using the painter's tape. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect. Try to get it as perfect as you can. Uh, one thing you can do to help clean up the paint is, you know, just clean it up yourself. Uh, you can go in and paint those edges nice and crisp with the same mixture. Or when you paint the next section, try to paint that edge nice and crisp over your mistakes. Uh, some other things to consider, if you're going to freehand this, is to have your mixture nice and ready, and then make sure you load your brush with just a hint of water. Water actually helps a lot when it comes to creating nice, consistent edges. Okay? And I want to make sure I load my brush with just enough paint. Okay? Not too much, not too little. If you don't have enough, it runs out really quick and you get those dry edges. And you want to keep your bristles nice and compact together. Notice my brush isn't loaded with like a huge gob, gob of paint on there and my bristles aren't a mess. So when I paint, I can paint this section real slow and just keep the edge of my brush right up against that line. I'm actually dragging my hand on the uh, canvas here, the paper here. I can switch to the other side. Okay, it helps to plant your hand if you want nice consistent edges here and a bit more control. And you want to stroke out into the form. Anytime you see a uh, you're losing paint or getting not so crisp an edge, bring it inward towards the form and then go back, load your brush up again. Okay? And like I said before, you should have enough to keep the mixture in certain shapes, especially if you're painting symmetrically. You want to keep the, the mixture the same. I'm not doing a good job of that, but I can go back in with that mixture and then paint over that fuzzy edge. Because I painted inward, it doesn't really affect my form all that much. Okay? And when I get to a corner, I just change direction and keep going. Okay? Chances are when you paint with a larger brush, your corners are going to, you're going to want to do those with a smaller brush, okay? You can get up to the corner, but not quite in that corner with the big brush. So I'm going to leave those open for now. Just keep painting here. Flatten that out. Being very careful. Okay, so we got this corner right here. I can bring my paint just about up to that edge right there. And you can see I'm getting kind of sloppy because I'm going too fast. But I won't be able to get in that corner. How do you do that? Uh, well, the answer is pretty simple. Use a smaller brush, okay? And just bring it in there as close as you can get it. If you don't quite get it, uh, go back with your other colors that surround it and sort of close up that corner, okay? That flat, I was able to get in there quite precisely, but I kind of messed up this edge here. So we can maybe make that a little bit bigger, and that'll fix that. Okay, but I'm going to switch to a brown to get that other smaller corner there. So clean up my brush here, okay, and then switch to a round. Rounds have the really uh, pointy bristles at the tip, and they're great for reaching those tiny little corner areas. Okay, so I just need a little bit of brush. Try to load your brush so that there's no paint gooped up on the tip, and just paint inward toward the form. And you can get some extremely detailed corners. Okay, if the bristles break apart, you will get a, a dirty corner, and you don't want that. So just practice doing that a couple times. It's not too bad. It can be a little frustrating. Uh, we also have very tiny brushes you can borrow if you need to make a really, really detailed center. Uh, usually that's where the problems arise, is in the center you make really tiny shapes, and then as you get further out, you make bigger shapes. So, again, I kind of screwed up in the corner there. We got too big. 
but that's fine. I can paint over that with my other colors, or I can mask it off and paint over with another color. Just let it dry. Don't make a bigger mess by continuing to paint. And that's really all you need to consider uh, for this assignment. Keep your edges very, very crisp. Uh, this side is dried now, so I could probably put paint over here and mask off these shapes around it and start painting those if I wanted to. I'm not quite done with my drawing. That's really all you need. Nice, precise edges, and then at least four colors with at least uh, 10 value shifts within those colors. They can be hue shifts as well. Okay, the other option for the paint handling assignment is uh, the impressionist painting. Uh, I picked a scene from nature, outdoors with natural lighting, and then I'm kind of loosely sketched in my sketchbook. Obviously, you'll be using uh, better materials. This is just an example. Uh, and I got my palette ready here. Um, I do have black on my palette, although I will warn you at the start of this demonstration that you cannot use black for this assignment. You cannot use black to paint with your Impressionist painting. The reason for that is simple. Uh, the Impressionist painters never really used black. They used a lot of other colors to sort of convey shadows or um, kind of uh, dark areas. So I'll show you kind of how to do that. Um, let's start, let's actually start with those shadow areas. So I got some really dark kind of really rich uh, greens in here. To make a dark green, you start with green and you're just going to add a little bit of red to it. And that will kind of knock it down. Okay. I can also add a bunch of other colors to it to make it darker. You notice that does a pretty good job there. Okay. Uh, I can add uh, some brown, kind of muddy it up, make it darker, more olive. Okay, I can add purple, and that'll really, really knock it back. That'll really kill it, make it much darker, richer, more evergreen, okay? So I can go in there and I can kind of just block in that sort of green there. I can also get these trees in here. Now, I'm going to be extremely loose with the paint, and I want you to be extremely loose with the paint as well. That's the whole point of this assignment, is to get that kind of loose feel. Okay, you're going for an impressionist look, so you don't have to be super precise. In fact, the less precise you are, the more loose you are, the more like an impressionist painting it is. If you haven't looked at the PowerPoint examples of impressionist artwork, please do so that you kind of know what you're supposed to be shooting for here. Okay, uh, I got that in there pretty well. That's all my dark greens there, and I can start to build up the other parts of the trees, light greens. Um, I'm going to show you some techniques for doing trees real quick here. I got a big flat brush right now, kind of a broad one. Uh, it's about a 10, I believe it says here, or 1, 7 maybe. I don't know. I can't read that. I think it's a 10. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some uh, lime green mixtures here, right next to my kind of dark green here to kind of keep my palette consistent. I'm going to add a little bit of white if I want to. Okay, and we're going to go in and just sort of lightly uh, douse these areas with some true green. Again, keeping a lot of space between our strokes. Okay, uh, if I need lighter value, I add more white, more yellow. Okay, and I can even check it against my reference here so I can paint with that light green. It looks like it's a bit too dark still, so add a lot more white there. Let's try that again. There we go, kind of getting lighter there. And I just want to kind of dab that green in there. I don't want to paint solid. Trees have kind of a broken texture to them. If I go in there and I paint solid, I'm going to have these solid, flat looking trees. I don't want that. I want nice, kind of broken, sort of uh, natural looking trees. So I can't paint, you know, these big, solid chunks of flat color. That would look incredibly unnatural. Uh, you don't want to ever paint large flat areas when you're doing Impressionism. Even when you do areas like the sky, um, just because that's just too lifeless. The Impressionists were after how light affects an object. So they, they really treasured those big areas of just texture and, and chaos. And they really embraced that with their brush strokes. They made kind of these messy uh, dirty looking paintings that had a lot going on in them. Um, now if I go into the grass here, I'm going to use a little bit of purple to kind of muddy up this kind of yellow right here. Okay, you can kind of see it's a very muddy yellow. 
can add a little bit of water and kind of shuck that in there. I can let it contaminate with green since that grass is a little bit of green in there. And I'm running out of white very quickly. But again, being loose. Okay? If I don't get the right color in the right area, and if I don't like how it looks, you can always paint it over. The more texture you add, the better. Uh, the more paint you kind of goop on there and let loose, the more impressionistic it looks. So the looser I, I go, the more impressionistic it is, obviously. Uh, what about when I want to do detail? Well, it's kind of like the same philosophy with the trees here. Uh, you can do detail. You can slow down and tighten it up. But you want to do that as casually as possible, if you can. So like if I go up to the mountains here, and I'm trying to make a mountain value here. Let's do some purples and some blues and some greens. OK. Uh, you know, get some base area color in there. Get some white. A uh, purpley mountain here. Mountains are purple, by the way. Uh, if I want to get the detail of the snow in there, just do it casually. Just kind of dab it in there. Don't let it be this laborious thing. Uh, you're going for kind of a sprezzatura effect. Okay? If I am more casual with it and just sort of react to the general shape of the mountains and the general texture of the mountains, I'll get a more accurate representation of what they are instead of this nice, tight, controlled representation, which is not what I want. Okay? The more you mess with it, the more tight and controlled it'll look and the less impressionistic it will be. If I leave it kind of casually there, that's the appeal of impressionism. This idea that they were able to capture it without doing hardly anything to it. Okay? So, I can add detail, of course. Use the tip end of my flat here to kind of drag some little spiny mountainy shapes here. Of course, using no black, just purples and dark values. Okay. Just having fun with it. All right. I expect you to try the same. Okay. Now, this was a fun little exercise for me. I hope that you're able to uh, break even further away from what you're using. Uh, I expect to see you try that. Let loose. I'm not doing every single little detail of these mountains exactly how they're supposed to be at all. You shouldn't have to either. This is just an, you're just giving an impression of this scene. This is just kind of a loose representation of it. It doesn't have to be this super tight thing. That is what the other choice in this assignment is for. If you're this style of artist, you need to let go of the form. You need to try to match the colors kind of loosely and have fun with the brush strokes. Really make a mess. If you can't quite see these, here, I'll bring them up closer here. Can't quite see these, all right? You see how loose that is? That's what you want to do. Play around with it. Don't feel like you have to completely control every stroke you make. The more casual the strokes are, the more fun it is and the more loose it will look. And if you get the color sort of close, you'll start to give that impression of what it is you're painting. Um, let loose. Let loose. This is the loose option of the two options.